say welcome to, to everyone who's joining us. I hope you've got a cup of coffee, notepad full, because the, the agenda and um, I think the discussions today will be incredibly rich um, for, 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 for colleagues. Um, so thank you, Shirley, um, in terms of a uh, bit behind the scenes. The, the, the session today, the, the Business South HR conference, um, as we are returning from uh, lockdown and, and into the future, uh, couldn't be a more ideal time, I think. So, so my name's Paul. Um, I'm Chief Executive and Principal of, of Eastley College. Um, we employ over 400 staff, so, so we're a fairly large employer in, in, in the region. Um, and certainly HR is at the, is at the forefront of, of, of my thinking. In terms of today, we've, we've got a, a great team. I'm just gonna do some quick introductions, just some, some of the names that we've got for you on, on the agenda. So Zoe Huggins, Chair of Workforce South, um, Mayor, Mayor Gosport, Education um, Sector, Rachel Bell, Stride to Glown, Joe Phillips from Carnival, Becky Lawton um, from Charles Russell Speechleys as well, we're all contributing to, to today's session. And behind the scenes with, with Business South, we've got Shirley Wynne Jones, who's our project manager and, and working, um, as I say, behind the scenes to keep it running smoothly. Andy Swift, Debbie, um, Kate and Natalie as well from, from, from the team. So just thought I'd do a quick introduction to some of the names who are, who are working to, to make this event as positive as possible. Um, Shirley, are you okay just to take it forwards for the, for the housekeeping? Um, so we should all be, I think, quite well adept at these now. So if you can, during presentations, keep your camera and audio off. That helps with bandwidth and, and clearly sound. Um, although when we get to the breakout rooms, everything on, please, so that there's full contribution. Um, use the chat, chat function, please. And can I put a big, big request out for, for, for the chat function to be used throughout so that when we get to the question and answers um, towards the end of the conference, we can have a really rich discussion about the things that matter to you um, and that the things you'd like to hear, views and advice perhaps from, from others and some of the panellists. Um, you can view and speak of you and side by side. Um, again, you may want to change that between the conference and, and the breakout rooms. And session is being recorded. It's also going to be available on the YouTube channel afterwards. Um, and in terms of subtitles, they are available um, if, if needed. In terms of the housekeeping as well, we do have two breakout groups, okay? And I just want to say at the beginning, you're not going to miss out from whichever group you're in because they're going to be repeated. Um, and those topics we'll, we'll go through shortly. So, so don't fear being in breakout session one that you're missing out on two, that they will be repeated and, um, and, and run through again um, so that everyone has that, that same rich experience. Conferences couldn't be possible without the support of others. So very grateful for Waverley, Borough Council, Basingstoke and Dean, Surrey Heath, Guildford Borough, Charles Russell Speechleys, and obviously Business South and Workforce Business South, all huge contributors and again, these events wouldn't be wouldn't be possible without uh, without the support of of others. So through the through the morning, as I've said, the team behind the scenes will be um, keeping social running and sharing some of the key nuggets, if you like, or some of the key takeaways um, from from this morning, and and really seeking to raise the profile of this crucial topic. You know, taking care of our people, inspiring them, their career development through this period is, is ever so important because organisations are about the humans, they're about the people at the, at, at the core of, of, what, of what we all do. So please do like, chat, get involved with the hashtag and follow it if, if you can. I think we're all, as I say, quite adept at the multitasking in, in, in the current world. And it's the at biz south hashtag um, and, and at um, on social and um, in, on whatever channel that, that that is that you that you follow. Certainly, LinkedIn will be busy, and I think Twitter is as well. So, in terms of the agenda, hopefully, I've set your the, the, the fears that, that you're not going to miss out on the breakout. You've got two key sessions that that, that will repeat. Um, so, we do have a packed a packed agenda, um, starting with Zoe in, in in just a few minutes. And as I say, the the theme of this the theme of this conference is this well-being, staying connected, mobility, the, the impact of furlough on our people, their ambitions and, and how we as organisations work to create the, the, the workplace probably of, of the future, because things, things will undoubtedly change as a result of, as a result of what we've all experienced in, in recent months and years. So there's some presentations, there's some Q&A, um, and it leaves me now just coming up to, to five past 10, um, to introduce Zoe Huggins for, for, 
for our first contribution in terms of our, our first speaker. Um, so Zoe, uh, Workforce South priorities and aspirations over to you. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, Paul, for the introduction and welcome everyone. It's um, great to uh, have you all participate today, although obviously still virtually, um, which hopefully in the near future will change. Um, I, I, you're only going to hear from me for a couple of minutes, mainly to focus on Workforce South. Um, but, uh, you know, our, our story and our experience over the last 14 months are very similar. They all have been driven by COVID. However, um, this unprecedented situation played out very differently across our sectors, across our organisation, um, within our own people, um, and even within our own lives, there were differences. And it's really key that we, we share those stories and those differences, although obviously um, we do have that um, common theme driven by COVID. We face an ever increasing level of exponential change in the near future um, and still um, short term uncertainty. My experience over the last 14 months within a global elite sports organisation um, within Southampton Football Club and my extended roles within the community. Um, so I have been mayor of Gosport um, since uh, June uh, 2020 um, in a very different ceremony than normal tradition. Um, I'm also chair of governors um, and I have over 20 years of education experience um, and I've also chaired a food partnership during these times within my role as mayor. I have been honoured to share my experiences with so many people, not only the hardship and the sadness that we've all experienced, but I've also seen great unity, strength, initiatives and the positive change. Um, social payback schemes that can contribute up to 42 billion to our economy, as well as obviously adding value um, to our workforce and supporting their well-being with activities, community engagement, but also uniting our local economy and our local people. I've seen social values at the heart of our business and changes to our contractual and procurement processes, which is great. Um, community initiatives such as Win the Morning, Win the Day, which saw a network of people um, locally within my borough, which is Gosport, that now I believe is national, uh, where people get together to do healthy walks, networking, and if you're brave enough during the winter months and in the summer, um, is to take a swim in the sea. We've also seen lots of things um, within our workforce, um, employee networks and well-being. And at Saints, we introduced things like the halo effect to counteract our 3,000 tonnes of uh, CO2. And we looked at our responsibilities within our environment, our corporate, our fans and our social um, responsibility. We also introduced initiatives such as the Saints at One campaign, which looked at our community action. And today we're going to hear lots of stories like this. And it's really important, like I said, that our story is very similar over the last 14 months, but there are many differences that we can all talk about within our organisations, within our people and within our own lives. There has been a cultural shift. So how do we learn and how do we keep that positive momentum? That is the focus today. We want to work collaboratively towards economic recovery in the central south region by building back a better and stronger workforce where thriving businesses create local jobs, support local skills, and where our supply chain and businesses add social value, where well-being, social mobility, diversity, and sustainability is front and center of our workforce. With all our efforts intent on driving recovery in the Central South following the pandemic, Workforce South can be that golden thread across all our Business South groups with our people at the heart. This year, our aspiration and our priorities start with supporting the Skills for Job agenda through the Education Business South champions. We also want to gain insight into the fallout of furlough and bringing a workforce back, continue to promote good news stories, encourage new initiatives around ha healthy, happy and a mindful workforce. We want to back an integrated sustainable development plan for Central South encourage and celebrate equality, flexible workforce and a diverse workforce. 
During the pandemic, the Workforce South managed to move forward a live student product with Solent University, where we submitted a brief to students to create an asset that showcased the positive reasons of why we live and work and remain in Central South. We actively reached out to Education Business South champions to support the business community regarding upskilling and reskilling. At the last Workforce South business meeting in March, we introduced the business champions with great success and impact, and we produced an easy guide for business and business champions. Action in human capital can create the momentum needed to recover. Our Workforce South health and development is going to be integral to our recovery. You as business champions are pivotal in creating that momentum, supporting positive change. And as Chair of Workforce South, I look forward to meeting and continuing work with all of you. So thank you. Zoe, thank you. And I, and I think some, some very ambitious things, which, which is crucial for us all as we, as we do move out into this COVID recovery and, and into, our, into, our next, uh, into our next future. Um, so next up, we have Rachel Bell. Um, and I have tested this in terms of the company name from Stride to Glown uh, to make sure it's, it's, it's correct. Um, and I think Rachel's got some very rich experiences to share with us all um, about how the, the firm and, and through her leadership, they've, they've worked through the, 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 the pandemic and, and what perhaps they're looking at maintaining for the future. So, Rachel, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much in advance. Rachel, how are you getting on there? Are you, are you looking as if you're all good? I lost the button to unmute myself and screen share. So let me start again. <laughs> I think everyone is very sympathetic in these eras because uh, it's, th things are very close to each other on the, on, on the screen. So, uh, okay. Okay, well, how the, does I've that look? Slides. Yeah, I've got that, the slides. That, so I think excellent. we're good to go. Thanks, Rachel. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, and good to see everyone today. Let me just move you aside. So today I'm going to talk to you about how Stride Glown have been weathering the COVID storm and how most important assets of us, our staff, have been keeping connected and how their well health and well-being is, is at the forefront of every day. We're a business of 350 people across nine offices, or you may say 350 offices over the last 14 months. And we're an architectural practice uh, with a number of other complementary services like town planning, interior design, and much more. So before the pandemic, we've been building up resilience across the entire business, building up the reserves in the piggy bank for the next, COVID, the next storm. COVID was the next storm, having been through the 2008 recession, and building up resilience is not done quickly. This takes years, and we've seen many benefits to the wider company culture, which has supported us through this current storm. As for our culture, and it's difficult to sum it up in one word, we've done a lot of work in this area over the last few years. To start off with, this has been very much driven by the staff rather than being imposed by the directors. We became employee owned about eight years ago, and through the employee forum, our staff summed up their perception of the Stride Traglown culture. They identified three themes, the first being freedom, to work flexibly, progress professionally, express creativity, and positively influence change across the practice. Integrity, to do the right thing, lead by example, be open and honest, and act professionalism. Individuality, to try something bold and unique. So over the next three slides, I would like to just take some detail of the aspects which we've built up over those years and then how each of those has helped us ride this current storm. I'll look at openness and transparency, health and happiness, and then touch on the infrastructure and remote working. So firstly, openness and transparency. 
For many years and since being employee owned, we've had really regular updates through and following the uh, monthly board meetings. We are really transparent about how we are doing as a business. And this comes down into individual projects and not hiding any information about how profitable they are and how the financial tools are being used across the business. So when COVID hit, the directors uh, were meeting once a week and that transparency continued. We reported weekly on how we were doing as a business. And that has been really well received by the uh, employees across the business. That does come into a lot of challenges around internal communication, especially when everyone's not sat in an office. We've also been very aware of making everyone feel as though they're part of a big business or a business um, because they have been remote. So we've held many uh, company wide webinars and things like our uh, chairman were, was writing Christmas cards to absolutely everyone and Easter eggs being sent out to people. Our longer term and what we've been building up over the years is very much a coaching led approach. And we put health and well-being front and centre, quite a challenge in an industry which has long hours culture and has even been harder during COVID. We were the first organisation um, to achieve an excellence in all eight areas of the workplace well-being charter, and that was back in 2016. Our wellbeing charter is reviewed regularly and this continually invests and, uh, and, and highlights what staff needs and expectations are. We've done many things like mental aid first aiders and most importantly through COVID we've been trying to ensure that people are not burning out with the intensity of working at home and in trying to relay messages of disconnecting so we set up very uh, many initiatives like our healthy homeworking, so videos, uh, interviewing staff, seeing how they're doing, and a winter well-being series of activities. So we even had Amy Williams, the Olympian, on a live Get Active session each week. We've been doing staff pulse surveys. We've been trying to hold the tea and talk sessions that we've been doing in the office ordinarily, but now virtually, and capturing those water cooler moments as you would get in the office. We've also been leading from the top, so very much aware that the directors need to show this behaviour. And so uh, I've been going out on morning walks, making sure that I have a lunch hour booked. I'm not booking meetings during that lunch hour. And a fellow director is very uh, much talking about his dog walks and ensuring that he goes out on a, uh, a dog walk over lunchtime and doesn't answer phone calls. We haven't stood still uh, either as a business. In February, we certified as a B Corporation. For us, this, this was a natural direction, providing a framework for many aspects of the business to be drawn together. B Corps and B stands for better are businesses that balance purpose and profit and the impact of their business decisions on workers, customers, suppliers, community and the environment. Other brands you may be aware of are Pucker Herbs, Patagonia, The Beauty Kitchen, and we're still in the very early days of adoption. So from an infrastructure and remote working viewpoint, the construction industry as a whole had an immediate slowdown where sites were closed and there was just what happens next. Uh, the industry has been supported and with sites opening and generally technical staff all being able to manage to work from home, we have continued pretty much um, as you would expect. We furloughed about 10% of staff on average um, and that was helping to support working parents, um, people that uh, just needed time out, but also with a slight dip of work at that point. We work across lots of public sector. So we were, we were kept extremely busy with Nightingale hospitals and of course that intensity of work. We, our IT system worked extremely quickly, our IT team in implementing a 365 Microsoft rollout, which was an extended project and they had to accelerate. And of course, as architects, we are running lots of high powered um, projects and across an IT system. So we're very aware that some people had to be back in the office. So we've had offices open when they have been and people have been able to work um, across offices and at home. 
And so what does uh, 2021 and beyond look like and where do we take this forward? So we're adopting a concept of hybrid working uh, with employees and that means changing one or two documents, but importantly, it's the way that we manage our time. And we're also setting up future working groups to look at how we travel, how our office spaces work and the practices and behaviours that we want to um, show. So that's looking at ensuring the benefits that we've seen over the last 14 months are not forgotten. So we're paying back into the piggy bank, essentially, going forward. We have a new wellness charter being reviewed. We have new learning and development strategies and with the new hybrid or agile flexible working models. Thank you. Rachel, many uh, Rachel, many thanks. Um, some some similarities with with life here at Eastleigh as well, whereby we've also adopted a, a sort of flexible working policy already. Um, that 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 is in place, and how we're managing our our staff development, the mandatory training, and that work from home um, is 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 already well underway here. Um, I'm just before. Just before we go into the, the breakouts, we've got a question um, from, from Sind. Um, I'm just going to bring that up. I think it's going to be Cindy. Um, guidance on developing a global work from home policy for permanent remote employees. Um, so, Cindy, I, I can't quite see your full username on here, so hopefully I'm, I'm getting your, your name correctly. I, I think from just the experience that, that we've had of working on a national remote, because um, we, we do have some what we would call peripatetic staff who work for us across the country is first thing is communication. Second thing is consultation. And the third thing is getting it checked out with um, where you end up, getting it checked out with a, a very friendly HR lawyer, if I'm honest. And that's not friendly on the employer side. It's just friendly as in how do you think this is going to work mo moving forwards? Um, so I, I think in terms of just some, some tips I would share for, for that, um, just from just from experience of that national work that, that, that we've done. Um, so yes, I, I committed um, Cindy Wilson. Excellent. Perfect. I can now see it come up. Um, so yes, Cindy, hopefully those, those three things are just some experiences. Um, and as I say, we did make a commitment to, to getting back to everyone in the chat. So in terms of the breakout groups, um, as I said earlier, you needn't fear about missing out with, with anything at all. Um, there are two breakout groups and they will repeat. Um, this will be the Zoom hook experience that we all have at, at this time, whereby we get a countdown and automatically sort of hooked off stage back to the back to the main event. Um, so behind the scenes now, Shirley will be putting each of you into into one of two breakouts, and they are as on the screen. Zoe from Workforce South can lead one, and and Becky Lawton from Child Rusty Speechless is going to is going to lead uh, group two. And the topics of those groups are, are as, on, as on the slide. Again, really important topics for all of us in, in, in these times. So um, Shirley, if you can do your wizardry, please, with Zoom, that would be fantastic. Um, and we will see everybody back here um, for the next session at around 10.39. So thanks, everyone. Hello, welcome. You're still being spotlighted, Paul, I think. That's all I can see you, front and centre. <laughs> Zoe, I'm going to, um, I'm going to leave, leave the room and go back to the others in, in, in the main event. So I should... Uh, okay. I'll, so I'll, I'll, I'll see you in a bit. Uh, perfect. Um, we, I believe, have 13 participants in the room. Please feel free to turn your um, videos on now. Um, if we can sort of remain on mute and then hopefully we can sort of manage it that way. Um, if you, uh, I don't know, Kate, if you can take the spotlight. I don't know if it's my, it might be my view. Hang on a sec. Ah, there you go. I can see you all better in a gallery view. Um, if you do want to ask a question, you can pop it in the chat. However, you do have a hands up facility. We have noted that sometimes um, people do not have that facility. So if you um, want to use your reaction and put a thumbs up or a clap, then we will um, take that as a, that you want to speak. 
Um, we have uh, up until um, just most probably about 22 uh, minutes and obviously we're a small group so fingers crossed we can all contribute. The main focus of this session is about sort of uh, thinking about your workforce, social mobility, levelling up or staff CPD, staff training, reskilling um, and sort of the challenges over the last year, I think, for me, highlight the need to sort of rethink and rebuild and, and bring back skills and education um, uh, closer to, in, to the employer market and widening that opportunity. So do we have any thoughts, any questions? Um, like I said, I've got about 20 years in further education, so hopefully I can support some of the questions that you might have but we've heard some stories today it would be really good to hear some of your stories around how you're supporting maybe introducing um, a, a new workforce so I don't know if any of you participate in government schemes such as kickstart or traineeships or apprenticeships but also how you're supporting that return to your workforce so are you looking at, we heard about mental health first aiders, for example, are you upskilling and retraining? We've got a shy group. <laughs> Anyone want to introduce themselves and maybe their workforce and, and talk about their experiences this morning? Hi, hi everyone, I'm, oh, I'm Cindy. Cindy Wilson. Hi, um, I work for um, a global business. Uh, we're US based, but I support our UK, um, Europe and Canadian employee groups. But I think one of the challenges that we'll have is whilst, I, you know, I'm certainly very <clears throat> keen on uh, development and skills and, you know, just making staff feel that they are valued and, you know, we want to retain them. But we've had quite a significant reduction over the last year because of COVID globally. So everybody is doing more with less I'm sure most people are and it's finding probably the time and then having the leaders kind of back this and because we are a global business we're privately owned it's very difficult getting <clears throat> approvals for things sometimes so we have a really good um, learning like a virtual learning database which has got loads of courses and that's always kind of the go-to point but I don't always think that that's great for everyone and I think given you know, we've been doing so many things virtually. I think it's good to try and where, when we can uh, to connect with people face to face or, you know, go on a course or whatever it might be. Um, so I think that's the challenge as an HR professional. I think it's really important, but I know for the business, they'll really struggle because we haven't got enough resource. So I don't know if other people are finding that. Yeah, and I, I think you're right about the online training, I think, especially when we, we look at introducing training such as mental health first aid or um, diversity or psychological safety and, and those honest conversations, because remotely actually prevents a challenge and a barrier to, to having some of those conversations in itself within that training, isn't it? Um, and I think it's sort of extending from Cindy's experience, I'd be really keen to hear from anyone if their experience having their workforce on furlough and then suggesting that they're returning and then these individuals saying that they have another job and now retaining that, that other job and not returning to you, although you've retained them on furlough for the last 12 months. Do we have anyone else that wishes to share their experience? I think I would say the remote training definitely we found because we provide I work for Paris Smith so we provide training to a lot of our employers and there just isn't the appetite for it in the same way because so much of the learning is being in a room with other people learning at that so the same time in that kind of ongoing dialogue and I, I think everyone now for months has been waiting and waiting until we're back in the office and it, it's just been a much longer wait than we perhaps anticipated so I think there has been a real gap because we've all been hoping we can return to it perhaps this summer and, and now it's still something that I think needs to be addressed but everyone's hoping that we can do it in person and I think there'll be a real leap once everyone's back in the office to say actually now I'm back you know I would like to do x y and z but there's just not the confidence or the desire to do it remotely 
Yeah, we've we've had sort of a ping pong effect, haven't we, of of hope and then that being dashed and we're even mm. sort of going through that period now, aren't we, that we all have hope of some normality beyond June. But um, I, I think that, that that is most probably in itself still something that, that has huge questions and how do you manage that within a workforce as a leader or a HR professional, isn't it, of of where we we always have been taught that that change needs to be steadied and you bring people with you um and yet on a daily basis we're we're saying something that we said differently the day before and and you have that continual change don't you mm -hmm. um uh, are any individuals introducing any of the um government initiatives to help kickstart the economy so i don't know if you're aware of of some of the the new white papers that have, have been released. So the first one was um, called Skills for Jobs. Um, that was released um, uh, early this year and it has now been backed by the Skills and Education Bill that was passed on the 18th of May. There's some fundamental things around that and this is where I'm really passionate about because although I just said I spent 20 years in further education, I actually have worked in the commercial world and I really do believe there's great strength in actually having employers at front and centre of that education system. Um, and some of that bill, just so you're aware, is that they are legally binding legislation now around local skills improvement plans. So stopping some of the competitive that maybe training providers do and actually look at that local improvement um, skills plan. So the local skills gap, local economy, but actually having employers um, as part of that and making it legally binding. So training providers don't just say it in jest or in their mission statement, but actually um, uh, actively engage and you're seeing some of that in some of the training initiatives that are being produced so you may know some of these um hopefully so you've got a kickstart program which is a bit like a workplace you've got traineeships which are similar to work placement you've got apprenticeships that have been around for a little while um the new scheme since 2017 um, we have other things now called T-levels, which also call upon a large proportion of work placement. Do we have any of our participants that, that do that within their organisation? Do you have an intern or a traineeship or an apprenticeship scheme at all? Hi, I'll speak again. Sorry, it's me. Okay, but, um, so we did have two interns. We had a really um, focused intern program for uh, university students. So when they do their third year um, placement, but because of the RIF, um, we didn't have budget for it. So that's kind of been scrapped, certainly for the UK and Europe. We're mm. still doing it in the US, but, but we don't have any other um, of the government schemes. But I think they're all great initiatives. Yeah, I think the the key there, Cindy, is we are finding that obviously companies are looking for efficiency savings and sometimes that that training pot, that CPD pot can be quite difficult. Um, some of the new initiatives, just so you're aware, there is a strategic development fund that um, uh, has just um, closed, unfortunately, but it will continue to pilot over the next three years that actually help with some of that membership that I just talked about, because you as, as key um, business um, workers obviously need to give your time uh, and energy, so we need to look at that. But there are also incentives to take on apprenticeships, um, traineeships and kickstart programs. So it is worth um, knowing about those. Um, and our work with our education champions, just so you're aware, um, have supported that. So like I said, um, within my short um, speech, the education champions um, listened to the workforce group about how complex that landscape is and how can we support you in understanding it. I've mentioned just a handful um, and believe me there, there are lots of different schemes out there and our business champions are key to un unpick that for you. Um, Kate, did you, you had your thumbs up? Yeah, no, actually, you, you, I think you and I, you, minds think alike. I was literally just about to say the same thing because, um, you know, so my role at Business South, as you know, I sit across all the different action groups. And that this is just something that I'm hearing time and time again, where that there's, there's a real problem, isn't there? There's a real barrier between everything that the government is implementing 
and the understanding within the business community of how to unlock that and access this and actually use it effectively to get those grassroots, you know, get in with different sectors and training at grassroots levels so they can safeguard their own workforce. Um, and, and it's really frustrating to hear, and I don't know what the solution is. And I think that's the power of um, Workforce South, actually, is and especially having individuals like you chairing the group um, to really help the business community community navigate their way through all of that because we know that there's a skill so shortage within the digital um, area within construction with regards to sustainable skills and you know we've got so much talent within this region that it would be really great to start plugging those gaps so yeah you covered the, the things that I was thinking. I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> um, yeah and I think the the other initiatives that we're seeing come through regarding some of the education bill is that they are wanting to make digital essentials and environmental sciences or environmental sustainability um, integral to a lot of the apprenticeships no matter what sector or apprenticeship you are doing and the T levels which is vital we've talked about English and maths for years and they have now been fully embedded and an integral part of those programs we are now and the government is suggesting that digital essentials and environmental sciences or um, sustainability should also be an integral embedded part part of those programs just briefly then there i don't know if you're aware but there is also a leveling up agenda um, which looks at the the infrastructure, many things um, uh, nationally, but but mainly leveling up from communities to infrastructure to to the skills that we've just suggested. There's about um, three billion national skills fund to support that leveling up, um, and and just some local areas that that I'm aware of. There is a priority. Um, so similar to assisted areas. So if you do work within these, there, there is a whole list, national list. But just to give you some, a few, um, my local area, um, so uh, I'm in Gosport, is actually a priority one. Um, so is Eastbourne in the central south. Um, Reading and Southampton are priority two. Um, but yet we have Bournemouth and Fareham as a priority three. So some of those levelling up funds, that three billion that I just talked about, are going to be prioritised within those areas. Um, there is a large proportion that's prioritised northern, but but there is there is quite a few for us at South or Cent, uh, South Central across those um, priority areas of one and two, more importantly. Um, but it looks at investing in our towns and our cities um, and our coastal areas, especially um, the majority of, of, of where we are and central south. Um, it is looking at how our economy is working and more importantly, um, we say town and town centres, but our economy is no longer in our town and town centre. Um, and some of the things I know that I've talked about um, within some of my roles and, and business is what do economic corridors look like? So in South Central, Central, for example, we've now got the Freeport investment. We've got investment in our cultural and travel and tourism. So how do we connect across um, South Central? And some of that for me is our connectivity. So it is our uh, digital connectivity um, is the, the first one. So how do we look at, at that? We've actually in Gosport got um, a robotic company wanting to work from one of our historical forts. Um, but yeah, our digital connectivity is a huge problem um, for us here in Gosport. It is also our infrastructure, so our, our, our trains, our, our motorways, um, but also how we travel. And we talk about sustainability, so it necessarily isn't about getting in a car and driving anymore. It is how we how we can connect. So um, I just wanted to give you some information about that, but I'm still really, we've got a couple of minutes left, really keen to, to hear from experiences or maybe any questions that you might have around some of those type of initiatives and funds um, that I just talked about. No, hopefully you might have some questions for the panel at the end. We have uh, one hand raised ah, actually. Hi, so it, it, it's, it's Tim Fora. Um, Hello Tim. Sorry, sorry my, um, my video doesn't seem to be working, I think we blocked out, but, but that's probably benefit for the rest of you, frankly. Um, <laughs> What I think, what I think the, COVID, the pandemic has, has really done is accelerated things which were happening in any event. Mm -hmm. So in about six months, we probably moved on, would have taken us six years. Uh, 
in, in Blake Morgan, uh, we were already reducing our office space because we were starting to work in a hybrid way. We're moving that way and we've just accelerated it. Um, and I think you're going to see massive change in the way we work. We will work in a hybrid way. I think that's going to be across large areas of the economy. There'll be a reduction in the requirement for office space, that's particularly in towns, and a, a huge demand, increasing demand for, for um, fiber cables and all that sort of stuff. So that we've all, all connected that way. And in, I, I live in South Sea and we've just had full fiber put in. Uh, and it is making a massive difference to the way we work. Uh, and I think what you're seeing now is the start of a revolution. Um, you'll find that the office spaces in towns in particular will go. Uh, so we're all gonna have to work more flexibly. I think it's gonna be good. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There is definitely positive momentum. The question I have from a regeneration point of view is what do you then do with those spaces? Because residential necessarily isn't the answer and, and the economy is then going to move out of those areas, isn't it? Well, that's, that, is, that is the risk. Um, we did a future, uh, future city study. I don't know if you, have, you saw it, the Blake Morgan future city study, uh, which was sent out all last year, which is probably pretty good timing. Residential is part of the part of the option, uh, not least because we've all got to build more houses uh, down here. Um, so that's going to be part of it. But it, it's going to reimagine what the high streets are going to look like. It's not just going to be retail. It's going to be other activities. If you go to South Sea, the old Knight and Lee store there, mm -hmm. there's a gym opening up in there. There's we there's all um, what do you call it? Cooperative working spaces, uh, hotel, and I think it, it's just going to look, look look a bit different. But we've got to be flexible. It is. On, and that last note and thought, Tim, because we're just about to be kicked out and go back to the main room. Um, thank you very much. And uh, you will go to the second group, um, the second part of the sessions. OK, well, that is the Zoom welcome back hook that gives you whiplash across the, the, the virtual world. So um, I hope those first breakout sessions were, were positive for, for everyone. At this stage, could I just ask everyone to, to mute again and switch cameras off just again around, around bandwidth, please, as, as we return back to the, to the main conference. Um, and this, this next session um, is a conversation um, between Joe Phillips from Carnival um, and, and Zoe Huggins from, from Workforce South. Um, and Carnival and, and the cruise industry, clearly, we, we've all seen it on the telly, and I, I think we're about to have a very rich a very rich 10 minutes in terms of the experiences of, of, of that. So, Joe, thank you in advance um, and, and nice to see you. And, and Zoe, over, over to you both. So, uh, yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Paul. And, and hello, Joe. It's uh, lovely to be in conversation with you. Um, and I think that the carnival story is a very unique one. I talked earlier on about our stories can be very similar because we all have COVID pandemic, social distancing, we're all using language we've never, never used prior to COVID. Um, but obviously your, your story and the impact to, to COVID to Carnival is very, very unique um, to, to your organization, your local employment, the local economy, um, but also specifically across your sector, travel and tourism, and more specifically the, the cruising um, sector. Uh, there has been obviously negativity and, and hard times around some of that, um, but, but there also has been your own unique positive drive to retain and engage your workforce and involve a business that, that was, and, and in, in essence, is still a, a standstill. Um, so it would be really good, firstly, to hear from you, um, Joe, around sort of your staff communication engagement of how you kept your employee morale high during these uncertain times and how you keep your staff engaged, especially remotely and during furlough. Yeah, morning, everybody. Um, and hi, Zoe. Nice to meet you virtually. Um, what a good question. It has been, um, like you said, super tough for us. You know, I think um, it's been tough for everybody, but particularly the cruise industry. Um, and, and I think for our employees, um, you know, there's people have been going through their own personal experience of the pandemic. But equally, we've had the, the really tricky business situation that we've been in and they've had to contend with that as well. So. And um, I guess, firstly, I would say that we really genuinely kept front of mind the quote that's kind of been doing the rounds and also happens to be relevant to our industry, 
funnily enough, that we're all in the same storm, but we're in very different boats. And you said it earlier, I think, Zoe, actually, everyone's situation is different. How, how people have experienced lockdown is different, depending on, you know, individual circumstances, family situation, home situations. And so what they've needed from their line manager or their colleagues or us as a business has been very individual. So really, we've focused around um, individual, open and honest conversations between line managers and employees throughout this whole period um, that's been really key to understanding different people's needs and we've been really clear from the off that the safety and well-being of our people is the highest priority so we've set the tone for that from the start um, I think I just wanted to, to mention we've got we've got a fairly clear people strategy at Carnival UK and we have four um, pillars to that and a couple of those in particular have been really important through the period so I was going to just talk a little bit around those so we talk about distinctive culture um, and also brilliant opportunities. So those are two pieces of our people strategy. And I think I just wanted to call out, and I don't you, know, you guys will all have experienced this differently and be focusing on different things, but it's really easy, I think, in turbulent times to lose like, some of that focus on the longer term priorities. And we've been really trying, we've been doing a bit of a walk like an Egyptian. So we've been trying to keep one hand on the, the now and really having to react and respond and keep people safe, etc. But also trying to keep a hand on the, the more strategic stuff. So um, in terms of distinctive culture, and this is relevant to the engagement piece that you asked me about, um, we've got a vision about being known and chosen for who we are. Um, and, and largely that will be as a result of like, the work we're doing on culture. So we continue to really dial that up throughout both ship and shore. So for colleagues on our ships and, and those that would be in Southampton and are now at home. Um, We've had a strong focus on our values in all of our communications and some of those things just so that you know are around speak up, listen and learn, respect and protect. So things that throughout the pandemic have been absolutely critical. Um, and also we've been really dialing up employee wellbeing. And I know we've had quite a lot on that in the earlier session, um, but we've encouraged people to work in a way that works for them, recognising, you know, the, the remoteness of our work and the need to focus on, you know, um, like somebody said earlier, ability to get outside, get fresh air, flex your hours, make sure you put some um, stuff that you love into your day, because I think people were finding that um, they weren't doing that. Um, we, it's been a hugely busy time for us. So, And then just around engagement per se, we, got, we did a survey just before the pandemic hit, and we did another one in September 2020, which highlighted themes and issues and surfaced some kind of key expectations from our people. Um, and as an exec team since then, we've hosted a monthly session for all of our employees, which gives us the opportunity to address the questions that people are um, asking. And we've been doing that head on. So we've had questions submitted in advance and we're tackling some of those nutty questions that you know people rightly are asking. Um, and I think the other thing that I'd say about our setup from an engagement perspective, and others of you might well have a similar thing, is we've got employee experience groups. Um, set up, which are basically colleague representatives in department groups who help to surface and respond to themes, and they've been critical throughout the period. Um, so very lastly, because I know I'm going on a bit, um, in terms of brilliant opportunities, we know that career growth is really highly valued in our people. I think that's probably common across a lot of organisations, but also that our people tell us they don't always know how to stretch and grow within our business. So we've absolutely made um, real effort to dial this up and support people because we felt that that was important to keep them keep them engaged and to help them understand that we will continue to invest in them and we've used the phrase that our business may be in pause but your career isn't um, so we've launched things like a my best me development toolkit um, which helps people to kind of think a bit more broadly about their development needs and we've also seen an uptick in people submitting development goals on our system, like 50% growth in that. So it's been um, really well received. And we're trying to use every opportunity as we build back, um, which we are doing, and we will be build back our resources to develop and grow people internally as, as the opportunities arise. Um, very lastly, because it's important to us as a business, um, one of the things we know creates the glue for our people in our business in, in normal times is the experiences that we can offer. You know, we're a brilliant business. We've got amazing brands. 
when our building was was open um, fully in Southampton, we'd often have dance troops from the ships or singers in our atrium putting on shows for our people or the odd visit from a celebrity like Gary Barlow, who's our um, brand ambassador for P&O, um, or just other brilliant events. And so we have done a few of those things virtually, um, you know, not necessarily having exactly the same impact, but we've used some of our food heroes that are brand partners for P&O. So Eric Landlard, Ollie Smith, Paul A. Young, who's a chocolatier. So we've had some events where people have kind of been able to try and get a little bit more of that carnival feeling throughout the pandemic. Yeah, I, I love that, Joe. And I think all of us within our business sometimes um, don't know that we have experienced um, or really good cooks or chefs, but I mean, you've got brand ambassadors and Gary Barlow who, who could- Oh, hey, woo -hoo. We're very lucky. We are very yeah, lucky. Yeah, so, you know, your own um, uh, music festival um, remotely. Yeah. I, I, su I suppose that goes and just sort of very, very quickly to, to round up is obviously as a um, a sector that was at standstill and still actually there's, there's a bit of uncertainty in the near future for you. Yeah. Have, what have you done really to, to, you've talked about engagement, to manage that fear and job security, I think yeah. is the biggest thing. Yeah. Um, how long have we got? Just so that I know what I'm working to. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. So um, most of you all know it was in the press. Um, we had to take some really tough decisions in the summer last year and we lost 450 people as a result of that and had to reduce pay for a number of our salaried fleet colleagues, um, which ultimately was about survival. So, you know, one thing I would say um, is that we've just taken a, I think I said it earlier, taken a stance that we've been honest and open um, and, and answered hard questions head on. So we've had open and frequent commun communications with colleagues, Ship and Shaw, and those on leave throughout all of this. And um, the thing that's been key is being able to share openly regular updates on business outlook. So things around future trading and guest sentiment about the industry, you know, reassuring people about the financial viability of Carnival Corporation, our parent company, and, and the financial runway that we've got um, into the future, which has been really important. And I think knowing that there's been a huge vote of confidence from, from investors worldwide, which there has been, and it's incredible in our industry, um, and that that allows us to weather the situation without necessarily needing to generate any revenue right now has given people confidence. Um, we also know there's a healthy demand from guests to, to sail again and we've seen record bookings for future years so that's been pretty incredible and obviously we've got lots of reasons to believe and we've been sharing all of that with our people um I guess just uh, one thing I would say because it's the single biggest learning that I've had from this whole experience is the uh, the resilience and um qualities of our people and the belief and passion they have for our products and our purpose so whilst there have absolutely been doubts and wobbles and we've lost some people along the way we're really blessed that many people genuinely believe in what we do and actually want to be part of the amazing team that sees us return to sea um so you know we've got the external factors and we've got the internal factors as well that are kind of driving that forward um and then we've had health you know obviously the health fears and a variety of things that people have been experiencing and we've been dealing with that in the same way that most organizations would in proactively identifying vulnerable folks and making sure we set up the right working arrangements for them and you know not forcing people to come back into the office etc um we, yeah no thank you and, and and sorry we've run out of time because i think right. it's such a unique story joe i think we could have those conversations for a long time but i know we've got some questions so um uh, we'll move on to paul to continue the agenda but thank you very much joe thanks Zoe. thanks Joe, I think in, in the chat thread, Joe, there's a few things. If you can access them, we'll come back to in the Q&A at, uh, at, at 10 past 11. But, but, but I think um, an awful lot of that content re resonated. And um, I, I think we will have a very rich discussion at, uh, at, at about 10 past 11. Great. So we're all about to get Zoom whiplash again. Um, we're about to be, Shirley's about to find the hook and get us into the breakout rooms. Um, it will be the same groups, but different topic th this time. Um, so again, if you can now, um, when, when you land in your breakout group, cameras on, microphones on for that for that full engagement, um, and then we'll be back as a group um, for for the remainder of the conference um, at ten past at ten past eleven, um, and it's ten past eleven where we'll, where we'll take the take the Q and A. So it's back to Becky or Zoe now. So uh, thanks everyone. Morning everyone. 
Hi. Everyone's just popping up on my screen. Great. <laughs> so um, in this session, we're just going to sort of put those hideous bleak Friday evenings of the past where we were watching the news of CGRS scheme changes and lockdowns being released and ruining our weekends. Those are all days in the, they're all history in the past. And we're going to look forward to how we go about reintegrating our workforces in this new world of hybrid working, hopefully, and um, and uh, an arena where phrases like no jab, no job are even being discussed. Um, there are some challenges and we'd really like to hear from you. I thought we, we focused quite a lot on flexible working and, and agile working and, and changes that had been implemented. But one of the things we didn't get to ch um, chat about in the last session was really around um, a diversity and equality and, and how that's operating. And I think this new landscape of, from an employment law perspective is is a really exciting time to hopefully kind of re rejig cultures that might rely on presenteeism and 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 actually ho hopefully make working parents who might feel conspicuous sloping out of the office at five to pick up children um, feel a bit more comfortable. Um, so I wondered what your experience has been from a, a diversity of your workforce and how that has it been impacted over the last year. I mean, I think in general, um, it's been really useful for flexible working and highlighting how it can work for people with home working. We've had a lot of colleagues and a lot of businesses that we work with who are now looking at being more flexible, perhaps just having core hours with more flexible start and finish times or allowing people to work from home. I think the difficulty is just making sure people are still having that balance where people have been doing everything and doing childcare and working and actually um, yeah, making sure there's that um, balance that people are doing it because they want to rather than because they're still being pressured to fit everything in and it's not going to work longer time. But I, I think it's certainly opened lots of employers' minds um, to the benefits of flexibility and hopefully lots of that will stay. Yeah, well, I think um, Claire Wagstock from B2B Pitmans, we found it really helpful as well just for people to log in at points that is best for them, whether it's or later in the afternoon and take the afternoon off you know to pick up kids and things I do think it's important that um you know workforces do need to say just because someone is sending an email at seven or eight doesn't mean that you should be picking it up because that's just when their work pattern you know may now fit so it's still important that you have that work-life balance and aren't expected just to you know be responding to emails because they are being sent late or if someone happens to log in on a, a Saturday so that message is quite important I, um, I was reading a really interesting article actually about sort of the tools that we have in most business places like Outlook and and how you can use them to better um, address issues like that, like sending emails late in the evening and, and teaching people really about things like um, being able to set timers. So you might be working late and, and getting loads done and that's great because that's your quiet time. But actually those emails don't need to land in those people's inboxes until the next morning. So there's less of that kind of oh god they're emailing at 10 o'clock at night should I be emailing at 10 o'clock at night and we definitely had that I, I don't know if your businesses did when we when we rolled out laptops in our firm a lot of the junior lawyers were like, were like you know does this mean I'm going to be working all the time now um and I, and I think there is that kind of real um need to educate people and the, the culture and what's expected of them now that there is this sea change in the way we're working so I mean, from a from an equality and diversity perspective as well, I know that obviously there have been a lot of um, women have had to take on homeschooling during the year. And um, I was reading a, a survey by a campaign group called Pregnant and Then Screwed, which is obviously a hilarious word, but, um, who found that 65% um, of working mothers who had been furloughed cited a lack of childcare as the reason for that and I wondered sort of what flexibility your businesses have been offering over the last year and whether that will continue how how's that kind of working parent dynamic um evolved over the last year Becky it's, it's it's quite interesting um when you kind of think about this one of my one of my the scars of my life um I worked for 
uh, banking in 35 years, but I still remember vividly now. Um, I actually, both of we were working parents. We had a nanny, and uh, but uh, I, I found myself collecting the children at the school gate uh, on on occasions. Um, and I was working in Reading. I lived down in North Hampshire. And uh, sometimes you just can't get out of the office. And uh, the scar of my life is basically uh, being at the school gate and the kids were waiting there with the teacher waiting for me and I was the last parent. And I get, I, you know, I guess thinking about the way we're going now with that, that with hybrid working and flexible working, you know, that that must be ideal for some parents that that you can you can pick up from the school date gate during the day. Um, not feel pressure you can have a few minutes with the kids taking them back home or whatever so i think the i think the hybrid working and working from home i think you know that that must work must help i think parents uh, in terms of how they how they do it i'm recovered from my scars now and i've got a grandchild uh, but oh, uh, hopefully i've got a bit more flexibility uh, when that kind of challenge comes along yeah i think it, i think it is really hard and i think hopefully there has like you were saying Edie, Pittman's like has been a bit more recognition that you know whilst we're all professionals and we, we want to work hard and we have our careers that there are plates that people are keeping spinning in the background and we were talking in the last breakout session about how actually you know the last year people that, that perhaps are higher up the hierarchy and organizations have become a bit more human to their um junior employees because they've seen kids in the background trashing the joint and and you know that they, they've become a bit more um sort of accessible in that way and that can be a real real positive for the culture of a business as well and um it, we're not that's not to say that hierarchies should go to flat and people can do what they like like um i know pwc are going to a much more flexible model of working where people can start and, and leave when they like and finish early on a friday which sounds perfect but um you know that there obviously needs to be that balance but are you grappling with anything like that in your business at the moment sort of the the desire for change from employees but but maybe a bit more um reluctance from the top i think some employers that i've seen are looking to go more back to normal and there is going to be a mismatch between um people going back into the office at short notice but I think it is going to be more challenging because where you've got everyone working from home that it has been this great equaliser and I think the risk that employers need to manage going forward is where you have some people that choose to return to the office and some people that are staying at home is how you're still going to keep that balance so people don't feel excluded and career opportunities and the best work doesn't mm -hmm. for those that are more visible and I think where everyone's been in the same boat um, that hasn't particularly been an issue for teams but that is going to be harder going forward to make sure that it doesn't become that everyone feels they have to return to the office because otherwise they won't be seen in the same way. Yeah I think there is a real challenge about around maintaining that collegiate collegiality and 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 making sure that it's an inclusive environment but one that works for everyone. I mean obviously um, Joe was Come, sort of describing some of the initiatives they've been having and I'm sure you've all been part of Zoom socials and things like that but I mean hopefully people who are more home working when people do go back to the office might still sort of show their face for in-person events and and kind of you maintain that that atmosphere and that that culture that way but you're right it's going to be it's going to be tricky and and there is going to have to be some some thinking around initiatives that mean that people are fully involved and engaged in in business life mm. have you had any issues around um perhaps for example uh people not doing what they should be while they're um working from home because i know that's always a concern for management um when it comes to opening up flexibility Everyone's well behaved. That's excellent. <laughs> I was just going to say hi. Um, I'm Michelle here from Hampshire County Council. Um, we've noticed that actually productivity is pretty much steady or improving is what the feedback has been from very much the senior management team. And actually, we're going to have a new policy coming out probably in July um, around our new kind of working flexibly, probably more than that. So I think it's great to see a company of that size actually embracing that. Perfect. So, yeah. 
Becky, I do, I do worry. I do worry some of the reports I hear, and it'd be good to hear from the other contributors, that there, is, there seems to be a market now for selling to companies um, tech that can track employees' activity. Um, yeah. When they log on, when they log off, uh, you know, productivity, that, and that all feels very um, wrong to me, really. And mm. uh, if there's anything going to engender lack of trust between employer and employee, then I think that's it's that kind of tech. So, yeah. um, but I am seeing it, um, you know, I'm also seeing, I am seeing it in big employers as well. Maybe not, maybe not as bad as it could be, but uh, just a desperation to log on by a particular time. And, it, and that worries me. Yeah, I think, I think it's, um, it's really dangerous from a from a, an employment relation relationship perspective to kind of go down that road to be honest as you say it's all about trust and and I and I think it's about that flexibility if someone's as soon as you start saying well you were two minutes late logging in then they'll say fine well I'm not working a minute past five or five thirty and that's that and it just doesn't you don't get that give and take and and you need that really um, and as, as soon as you become rigid about and, and I think once you have the information, there is that temptation to have a look and see what's going on. And then it might influence decisions in a way that's actually really unhelpful because you can't see when people are working from home what's going on in the background. There might be carer issues. Um, for example, you know, somebody might have an elderly relative living with them that you're not aware of or whatever that can then potentially have discrimination issues if you then go down the route of saying, oh, you should have been here doing this at this time. Why weren't you? Um, when when people are less visible that there could be all sorts going on that you're not aware of I think as well as the potential discrimination arguments there's also the well-being arguments like a lot of income companies have spent the last 18 months saying to employees go for a walk go outside take time out and then if you've got a very rigid nine to five your lunch is one till two trying to then factor in those team to go for a run that might mean their lunch is slightly longer it's going to be quite difficult and again another factor of returning to work that employers are going to have to think about yeah and I, I really I really hope that things like presenteeism become a, a thing of the past I think it's a really like hideous aspect of working in an office really because um as as, as um we've highlighted in this session actually people are more productive at home in a lot of organizations and you and I think you can be productive in both aspects of your your life your home life and your working life if you're working from home and and that can be sort of really mismanaged when you when you start cracking the whip like that I completely agree things like exercise are going to be really important for people's mental health at the moment and going forward I think just working healthily is is going to be more important I think some people have sort of got off the hamster wheel a bit and thought, actually, this is a much better way of working. Let's let's do more of this. Um, so it'd be interesting to see really if if businesses are taking the opportunity to to change the culture, or if or if they're just firefighting and trying to kind of focus on profits if things have been a bit more difficult over the last year. I, I uh, it'd be great to hear from others, but I, you know, I, I suspect that the same leaders are installing tech on their members of staff's uh, kit will be the ones calling very quickly to try to get them back in the office uh, because that's the way they lead and that's the way they want their uh, their businesses businesses to run. The reality is, um, you get. You, you treat you get what you get what you do with um, you, you you sow what you you reap what you sow with employees don't you um and consequently they will vote with their feet uh ultimately yeah i mean one of my friend's husbands he um throughout the whole working from home during the pandemic has had to have throughout the whole working day a, a video call so that it's like you can shout across the office um but it, he also had a, a second child during that time who's obviously, you know, in the house with him the whole time. It's just it's a, it's a ridiculous way of working. And it, and it has meant that, you know, he's he's looking for another job because he just thinks, well, you know, this is just not a, a way of working in a place I want to work at. And and it's it's things like that that can really you can lose talent. 
Um, and, and I think, you know, people have enjoyed not commuting as well. So being too rigid about how many days you have to be in the office or, you know, if there's no client need or whatever, I think that can have an impact as well. But there has to be a balance. I think, you know, if you're going to have this hybrid model, then there has to be a bit of give and take on both sides there. And um, what about, uh, we were talking about um, with Joe, sort of in these socials and, and um, employee engagement in that sense of, of getting bringing people together. What have your businesses been doing? Anything in, innovative on that front? I think we're going to get whizzed out of here in a moment. Looking at the clock, or oh, we're still here. We've got two two minutes. Oh, two minutes, great. We we had a for example, we had a um, remote a virtual cocktail making class, which actually worked really well, and we got um, things delivered to the house, and um, we've had we've had Easter eggs and, and little things like that, little touches that mean you you're in touch with your your employees can make a, a big difference. I think we've we've done the same in terms of you know Zoom chocolate evenings or whatever the most helpful thing I've found in, is in our team we've set a coffee uh, afternoon time every couple of weeks where it's just half an hour or so but it's dedicated to not talking about work and actually as a team that's been great to catch up with people so sometimes it is still just the simple communication that's worked the best for us I think. I think those water cooler moments of being in the office are what people have really missed mm. that's the one thing people have missed is connecting with their colleagues. Yeah, absolutely. It's just all those little moments, isn't it, that adds up to something more. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard. I've, I've just come back from maternity leave and haven't actually been into the office yet. And so being back but not back is a is a really weird, weird way of working for me. And everyone else is obviously used to Zoom and, and working remotely. And I just about get the camera on. <laughs> I think that's the thing we found most challenging is where you've had new people join, like for us with trainees, you know, getting a connection with someone and working out how to work together when you've never met them in person is definitely one of the more challenging things oh, for, for them and for everyone else in the team. So be nice where you can greet someone in person. Definitely. I think it must be really hard starting a new job now. The skills work moreover were there any particular skills being being encouraged so for colleagues who've just joined us back um we're, we're now moving into the q a if you can keep the chat flooded with uh, with questions we'll do our best to get them so we've got joe rachel zoe and, and myself um for bandwidth purposes if you can keep your your cameras and, and microphones off and we will use chat so we're on the question from jamie jamie mckay um, and the question is supported to undertake CPD as part of their home working. Moreover, were there any particular skills being encouraged? So, Rachel, could I could I just kick that off by going to you first? Is, is that okay? Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, as architects or any any professional um, services industry, we have to undertake CPD to continue that, and so it was a vital part. And I think as as other businesses that would normally come into the office with you know their their lunches and their products and things, it was as much for them to upskill and and take that virtually. So we have had an extensive um, program of CPDs, but actually what we've noticed the fact that we can do it as a company now because it was office by office it's now much wider and therefore actually the whole business can benefit from it so um, both from individual uh, things that we might want to get across as well as those other wider products and um, upskilling so yeah that's how we've covered it. And Joe, I think you, you touched on this in, in your earlier con conversation, but could you just share if there were any specific skills that you've noticed? I think you referenced earlier about a 50% uptick in, in colleagues putting on development plan priorities of themselves. Yeah. Is there any, are there any specific skills coming through at all? For um, so, I mean, 
you know, it, there were there were lots of interpersonal types thing. You know, we we've got a big push around culture and behaviors and values and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot, there's a lot in that space. Um, and then otherwise it's dependent on the role. We're quite a diverse business in terms of the types of roles that we employ and the types of capabilities that we need. So um and from a CPD perspective, in areas where that's a requirement, like Rachel said, for you know professional qualifications, that would that just continued as as normal, really. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't say there was any skills coming out that were specific to the situation we're in, particularly. It was more just people getting a handle on their gaps and their development needs, and you know, and shaping a plan around it. Thank you. And, and I think I'd just share before we move on to the next question, one of the one of the aspects that, that we found coming through was actually leadership development. Um, and, and we launched an aspiring managers program during during lockdown, which is which is now being quite, quite refined. And colleagues who've been on that have, have, have found that found that to be quite positive. And again, they were they were more the transferable rather than the rather than the specific aspects in terms of the, the, the specialist requirements. So we move on to a, a, a next question, which comes through uh, from the first breakout rooms, actually, um, which was talking about some businesses in the breakout rooms referencing they were struggling to get employee engagement into, in, into the business priorities. Um, Zoe, from your workforce south work, is, is there anything you, you, you think, you know, from, from all of the meetings you've been in during this period, any sort of top tips that you think have come through or, or, or anything you can share on that question? Yeah, I think as we sort of were continued to go through um, COVID that obviously took and, and continues to take longer than we ever anticipated, that in beginning engagement was quite high. And I think we had all these remote initiatives and coffee breakout and employee roles. And and, and then suddenly I think it the the the, the sort of breaking point was most probably the third lockdown after Christmas, where we saw that fatigue of um, I'm, I'm joining, but I'm only joining in, in spirit. I'm turning my camera off. I'm not uh, engaging. Um, uh, and how do you sort of manage that? And, and companies manage that lots of different ways just by offering um, sort of various different things and I think similar to, to Joe when we heard about having brand ambassadors and in the football club we were very similar that we could have an audience with you know a footballer or an audience with the CEO or um, we had our chef similar to you come in and, and uh, do some some cooking and and sort of diversify that. I've also seen that out in the community. So um, as mayor, one of my charities with the Best Light Trust, um, and obviously really critical that they kept that engagement within their client base. And they did very, very similar to those small little groups, to the diversity of, of what is your skill as a person, you know, or what do you join um, enjoy and enjoy and passionate about from knitting, crocheting, to cooking, to um, talking about dogs is, is instead of focus skills, it, it moved to more that passion and enjoyment to engage because actually it's, it was more about people just still wanted some form of connectivity. Thank you, Zoe. And, and Rachel, obviously your, your presentation spoke an awful lot about a, a lot of the highlights that, that, that you've had in, in, in the period of, of, of the lockdowns and the restrictions. Are you able to perhaps share where there might have been some resistors to that and how they might have been brought on to become adopters and, 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 how, and how yourself and colleagues work, work to, to perhaps turn around the sceptical or, or those who were struggling to engage. Um, so I, I don't know if you have any experiences that, that you can share with the wider group. Mm -hmm. no, nothing that, that comes to mind. I mean, I think we've always got people that will not necessarily follow, follow the herd and follow the flock. And um, I think it's been much more about trying, trying to change people's perceptions and the the long hours that people are working and actually recognizing that it is good for you to have a break. Um, and so a number of people, even like addressing holiday days and taking some time out that things still carry on and that actually by by having that time out, you are doing something for yourself. So um, I think as, as Zoe was mentioning, you know, at the start, everyone was, was a bit more buoyant and wanting to give it a go and join in. And we have seen some drop off, but, uh, you know, as, as a company and through the employees actually 
backing each other up and being able to help each other out um, that has actually motivated people um, and so it's not always top down you will do this you you know you need to do this it was very much them driving some ideas and coming forward um, and so we've looked to them as much as as them looking to us as a board um, we have started new initiatives like our health and happiness, which is evolving um, and, and takes really some of the, the good things that I was illustrating earlier. So it's, it's always adapting, always kind of moving things forward. But I would, I would really look to people to engage with the employees because they have some fantastic ideas and listen to them as much as, as try and think as a board what you, you feel is the best way. So. Thank you, Rachel. And Joe, Joanna, is there anything you can add at all to, to that in terms of where you may have had some skeptics, resistors, and, and, and how perhaps that, that worked? And just um, you know, do you know what? I feel really fortunate that like people and engagement of, of our people has been central to what we've been doing for a number of years. So, you know, we have we have a regular rhythm of engagement surveys and we li we listen to our people. And so it, that stuff was coming through loud and clear about what they needed through this period and, and we're quite used to kind of responding so we don't always get it right by the way so you know lots of things we get wrong and then we go sorry guys like we you know and we um, we kind of test and learn and that's we're, we're getting used to that um but we you know at exec level we even have goals on our on our exec priorities around some of this stuff um which you know five years ago we wouldn't have done so that's testament to you know some of the work that i've been doing my team's been doing but yeah it's it's a kind of a natural part of what we do, I guess. Um, yeah, and I think it's, I'm rather hopeful that the sort of getting closer to staff is, is something that will continue, actually. Um, something I started off during the lockdown, for example, was every every Wednesday morning I'm on Teams for anyone to drop in to ask any question. Yeah. I've been doing, that, been doing that for over a year now, and actually nice. I'm yeah. going to do, do it forever, because why not? Well, what I, what I would just add, though, is that, you know, different managers will find it easier or harder to, yeah. to, to you know, and, and so what we've been focusing on, and you touched on it a little bit, around a leadership and management capability in this space is just equipping managers um, to really lean into this stuff and to feel confident yeah. uh, about some of the conversations that they have had to have because frankly there have been very different conversations that people have been having and and we've all had a window into people's personal lives that you wouldn't have had before you know which is yeah. great because it builds that connection but we've had we have had to support managers and individuals with that along the way yeah, yeah and I'm not expecting everyone to manage in exactly the same way either because everyone, no, exactly. everyone that you know authenticity and and, and being the, the real person behind the role I, I you know I yeah. think through yeah this. I was just going to add Paul we, we've we done exactly that we had conversations um, such as being your authentic self I think sometimes we when we work in a corporate world or uh, you know I come from quite a bureaucratic background that you you end up having that very um, staged type of conversation so how can you be authentic self especially as as Joe said you have now got a window into someone's life that you see their dog their child their partner um, in the background um, you see their their living space and and how do you then take down those those barriers as a leader and a manager and have those authentic conversations um when actually body cues and body language is very hard to to, to grasp um yep. Yep. remotely so the next the next question that's come in i'm actually going to ask becky becky lawton to join us in 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 the group so um shirley if you need to do any wizardry with spotlighting or anything else um <laughs> it, it would be great if becky could join us um, the, there's, there's been a question in, in the chat thread, and we've got probably after this one time for maybe one or maybe two more. Um, but the question is, can an employer ask employees to confirm they have received the COVID vaccine and the dates? Or is this personal data and falls under GDPR? So, so Becky, we're very fortunate to have um, you, you in the group. Um, let, let, let's hear it from you. Well, I mean, it's a typical lawyer answer, but it's not straightforward, unfortunately. Um, there are there are businesses who are sort of you've probably seen typical plumbers on the news sort of saying no jab no job and um, there are huge legal risks with sort of enforcing any kind of policy like that and um, particularly where there are other ways in which you can manage sort of COVID risks during this time that that are more proportionate and and less um, 
detrimental to to your employees so I mean you've got got a whole host of issues particularly with existing employees you might have individuals who don't want to have the vaccine for health reasons you could open yourselves up to disability discrimination claims there could be individuals who have um religious beliefs that mean they can't have the vaccine because they might have been um contain animal products or um have been tested on animals there's a whole political and philosophical belief issue that is probably going to be tested in the employment tribunals in the next year or two about whether anti-vaccine counts as a protected belief for the purposes of discrimination um legislation um the, the individual who asked the question was asking about whether it would count as personal data under GDPR and, and it would count as sensitive personal data. So if you were storing records as to whether individuals are um, have been vaccinated, then, then you'd need to be storing that very carefully in line with the, the Data Protection Act 2018 and um, your HR teams and, and you as HR professionals will be very familiar with sort of collecting per sensitive personal data. But there's a whole raft of issues you've got, for example, um, potential for age discrimination at the moment where where we're sort of cascading the the um, availability of the of the jabs could that mean that um, younger employees are disadvantaged over older ones who, who are more likely to have the jabs so we've done an article actually I'll, po I'll post the link in the chat that sets out all of the various issues to this kind of policy there are there is a consultation that I think is closed now or, or is about to about whether or not it could be mandatory for um, carers of adult vulnerable people in care homes um, to have a mandatory um, vaccination policy there in that sort of sphere. But um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in other sectors, for example, cruise ships. Um, that could be one where you might want to, to consider sort of an approach on that. But I'll, um, I'll post the link to the article. It's, it's quite helpful and sets out a whole plethora of issues you'd need to consider before going down that route. Joe, with the uh, the reference to the cruise the cruise ship, do you want to segue there, or do you want to swerve that in terms? No, I mean, listen, we've had loads of advice on this because we, yeah. you know, from from a from a ship's perspective, we're pretty confident that if we wanted to mandate vaccinations for our crew, we've got a legitimate health and safety reason to do that. And so we, I mean, we we haven't taken that decision. It's a global decision. You know, we've got lots of brands that operate across the globe, not just in the UK. So. Um, that's not something we've decided yet. But yeah, I mean, we've had lots of advice, both for land based people and ship based people. And, and as Becky said, it's, you know, it's complex. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think every organisation will be in it will be in a different space based on product service, etc. Et and again, I think similar to an answer earlier on, take take the take advice early um, and, and consider it as part of the sort of consultation and communication, I, 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 would, I would just suggest. Um, yeah, I think I think one of the things that we kind of have come to realization on, which is not, I mean, you'd be, be a bit like duh, but <laughs> um, is you know you you've, you've got to be think about what the consequences of some of those things might be. So if you were to to set to mandate something, what what are the knock on implications of that? Not less, not just from a legal perspective, but in terms of what you're how you're setting up your ways of working and the fact that then you might be saying that if somebody can't just genuinely can't be vaccinated, they're never going to come into the office again, or you know those kind of things have become really live things that we've been chewing on over the course of the last you know three or four months so yeah and, and joe i think we've Easy. we've been going through decision making here with sort of can we try and work out what the unknown unknowns are can we try and work out what the unintended consequence of this is yeah. because, because of how fresh all of this is yeah uh, there isn't a handbook is there and there isn't something that you can go to off the shelf and go that's the guy to, to no. do it. exactly so, and we, I mean, we've just taken a stance of encouragement, really. That's, you know, we're just encouraging people to, for, for, the, for the health and safety of each other, right, to, yeah. to have the vaccine. So that's, that's where we landed, but. No, absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, Becky, thank you for that. And Zoe, Rachel and, and, and Joe, thank you for your, for your, for your Q&A responses. Um, we, we, I think, have cleared up everything in, in, in the chat thread um, that, that's come in today. So I hope for those of you that have asked and that you've had useful responses that you can reflect on and, and, and take away and consider as to how, how you may decide to move forwards. Um, and then I think as it's rapidly approaching 11.30, it's just, um, it's just now thank yous um, and, and goodbyes. So it's, it's a many thanks to all of our, to all of our sponsors. Um, and it, again, events couldn't happen, couldn't happen without them. 
And uh, hopefully everyone who's been on the call will, 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 will be very, very positive about the contributions from uh, Joe, Rachel, Zoe and, and, and Becky, and have found the breakout groups to be, to be really, really helpful. Um, and I think just again, just, just to remind everyone that uh, the recording will be on YouTube later. So if there's anything that you want to go back to or, or refresh, um, and certainly Becky's um, resource she's highlighted, I, I have seen pop up in the chat thread. So you may want to just click on that link and download the, the, the PDF or, or save the uh, save, save the web page for just a future for just a future reference. So anyway, thank you all very much for for, for, for your time um, and and your contributions. Um, and stay safe, stay well, and all the best for you and your organisations in, in in the months and and year ahead. Take care, everyone.